fiscal year. I'm going to try that one more time. Salams and welcome to American Muslim Elected and Appointed Officials Network. Um, today's presentation and panel is on why representation matters now more than ever and in this critical year. Our guests are Mayor Farah Khan of Southern California, Delegate Sam Rasul of Virginia, and Nada al Hanuti, Executive Director of Engage Michigan. Our moderator will be Rebecca Husseini of MPAC. And my name is Dr. Dilara Saeed of the Muslim Civic Coalition. We wanted to start by sharing a little bit of context. The American Muslim community across our nation is over 400 years old. We are the first to join the American diaspora um, after the indigenous communities as African Americans and as Africans enslaved and brought to this nation. We helped build this nation. And then those of us who came from immigrant backgrounds over the last 200 years helped grow this nation and this communities. We now are three to 5% strong across the country. We are of every race, class, background, profession, underemployed, and every um, uh, background possible. So the question becomes, all right, we've done so much and we have built masjids, Muslim schools, uh, community centers, et cetera. We have generations that are coming uh, behind us, before us, et cetera, as you can see with me, with my little one, Aya. But what does that mean for us in representation? Elected officials in the US count in almost half a million. At the local level, of course, the largest level at 500,000, at the state level in every one of the 50 states, and then at the federal level. So in this number of elected officials, how do Muslims rank? Well, one of the things we do know is we don't know. We don't have all the data on the Muslim community. We think possibly about a thousand elected officials. So approximately what we're saying to you today is 3% of the US population has 0.2% of US elected officials. My friends and colleagues, that's a classic case of underrepresentation. And we're not looking at representation just for the sake of representation, but we're looking at representation because we serve our communities in every way as doctors, teachers, engineers, lawyers, Uber drivers, and good neighbors. We should also have public officials that understand us and look like us. Who's doing this work right now? Well, you're joining us at the American Muslim Elected and Appointed Officials Network, AMIAN. Please check out our website at amian.org. The organizations that lead AMIAN or facilitate it are the Muslim Public Affairs Council, America Indivisible, and the Muslim Civic Coalition. We will put up all three websites also on the chat so you get to know those organizations. Engage USA is trying to quantify this work and El Hibri Foundation is trying to codify it with data and lists and directories. And there may be others, if you know of them, please let us know. At this point, let's get going to the conversation. I turn it over to Rebecca Husseini from MPAC. I welcome you all to this conversation. And there are about 20 of us on here. Please connect and engage and put questions and comments on the chat so we can keep this as a discussion. Rebecca? Thank you so much, Dalara. Um, and thank you to our speakers, Mayor Farah Khan, Delegate Sam Rasul, and uh, Nada al Hanudi for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Uh, and thank you, Dalara, for that for that opening, laying out the um, basically the argument for what this webinar is about, which is why it's crucial for Muslims to maintain a presence in elections. Um, uh, laying out some general points. Um, the sheer size and budget of uh, the US government means that its actions touch virtually every aspect of our lives, and we're obligated to make it uh, better for all of us. Uh, we have a responsibility to maintain a presence in elections as part of ensuring the health of our institutions. 
and the rules of the games affect the outcomes. We must stake a claim in both the inputs and the outputs of the political process. Um, I'll uh, go ahead and uh, head into our questions. Uh, again, I want to welcome our speakers. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, starting with the first question, I'm going to um, give this to everyone on the panel. Um, go ahead and jump in as you, as you, if you have any any thoughts on the question. Um, do you think voting directly affects representation, and does it really make a difference? And if so, why do you think so? Um, I'm going to start with um, Mayor Farah Khan. If you can go ahead and start the conversation off. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, ah, yes, absolutely. Uh, voting matters, and it matters um, on so many different levels. Um, when we're looking at specifically, um, does it matter in getting the right people elected, getting that representation uh, that we need in our communities? Oh, absolutely. And I think a lot of times our communities, our Muslim communities, uh, don't understand their power. Um, and and um, that's where we need to start heading. And then I'll, I'll share a little more later, but I'll, I'll share how from 2016 to now, how the Muslim community in Irvine shifted the, the elective um, uh, process and, and became more involved and, and more vocal. And the more involved you get, the more um, access you have, and then the more opportunities are there for you. So I would say absolutely, uh, you have to be uh, a part of the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Farah. Um, do uh, any of our other panelists have any additional thoughts to add to that? Uh, Delegate Russell or Nada? Yeah, um, certainly as um, someone who has run for office and, and lost and run for office and, and won, uh, my first primary victory was by 44 votes. And so um, I get to go to like every group in my community and say, you all were the ones that helped push me over uh, the edge, <clears throat> 44 votes really gives you an appreciation for um, just how every vote counts. And when we, when we think back from an election perspective, how everything um, certainly helped uh, a little bit here and there. So I think it's easier for us as a community and, and others to feel it at the local and, uh, and maybe at the state level, a little harder at the federal level, uh, but certainly our, our votes do matter. Yeah, I just want to echo what my fellow panelists said. Voting equals representation. It's simple as that. Um, here locally, Rashida won um, in 2018 by 900 votes, 899 to be exact. Um, and honestly, it was uh, the folks on, in uh, Dearborn Heights, the Arab, the Arab American Muslim voters who actually helped her get over that finish line. Abdullah Hamoud, which I will talk more in detail um, in a little bit, won by 2,000 votes. Um, so representation does matter. And when our people go out to vote, that's how we elect people who look like us, um, uh, think like us, and um, have the same, same values. Yeah, absolutely. That's why it's so crucial to remain engaged, not just in the federal elections, but the local elections as well. Um, you know, there have been instances in the past, um, even uh, in federal elections, where it's a razor edge um, that that makes the difference. So that's why it's important for all of us to work together to activate our communities and and um, you know vote for uh, for policies that impact uh, people that will create policies that will impact us. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. Um, in terms of representation, what have you seen after the 2016 elections and what are you seeing now as we approach the midterms? Is our community, among others, running for office? Uh, what do you see out there on the ground? And um, I'll go ahead and open up to any one of you to jump in. I'll, I'll share a little bit about our area, and, and definitely a lot has changed since 2016. 2016 was the first time I ran, and it was so difficult for me to get our community engaged, to even believe that their um, voice mattered. And, um, you know, a lot of times when I was outside talking to them outside the mosque and, and having those conversations, they were sort of like, mm, I don't know, it's not that important to me. I don't like politics, or, or my vote doesn't really even matter. Shift that to today. Um, not only are they voting, but we are seeing more and more people running for office, which is amazing. And, and I think that shift is so important because the more people get into office, that inspires so many others to do the same. Because, you know, for me growing up, I didn't see anyone that looked like me in office or in leadership positions. Um, but for me to go into elementary schools, 
and have these girls that look at me and go, oh my gosh, I'm thinking I might run for office too, is so exciting. And I think that's really what, what has changed is the more people see us out and about, the more they get inspired. I think after 2016, um, we I saw this like resilience in our Muslim community, specifically here in Michigan. 2016 also is when we got Abdullah elected to the Michigan House. Um, we saw candidates like Rashida Tlaib run for office, Fayru Saad run for office, Abdurrahman Al Sayed run for office. So after 2016, we saw more of our people, you know, all the xenophobia, all this Islamophobia come out and really take a step forward, whether it was local politics or federal or, or running for a federal seat. So absolutely, I see I, I say 2016 really motivated our community to get out and, uh, and vote and um, and make sure that we're represented. You know, when I, I first ran for office in 2008, I ran for uh, U.S. House um and uh, asking people for for money or support especially from our communities was like asking them for one of their children you know it was uh very tough and and oh by the way a lot of folks were thinking oh we're going back i mean they're i'm palestinian a lot of palestinians are like oh well you know eventually we're going to be back there you know we're, we've got the old country and people realized uh, over the past decade this is our country you know this is uh, where we're raising our children. This is our future. Yes, we're proud of our heritages, uh, respectively, uh, but uh, the reality is, is that we need to invest here. And I think, you know, 2015 into 2016, um, if you remember in, in November, I think 2015 was the first time then a certain candidate said we were going to ban people of a certain faith to, from coming into the, of the Muslim faith from coming into this country. And, and then it became real, uh, I think, in a, in a lot of ways for folks. And uh, so certainly we have lots of uh, candidates who have sprung up since. Yeah, and, and that's been very inspiring to see. I know as a mother myself, I look to my children and, and they're very inspired by the representation they see. Um, I, I, I'm white, but um, you know my children are half Indian. So they're very inspired by uh, by seeing the representation, whether it be on screen, in their elected officials, or even just in the community itself. Uh, so uh, it, it's it's very inspiring to see. All right. Um, what would you say if a member of our community wanted to run for office for the first time? What would you recommend that they do? Where should they start? I'll so, start with you. Uh, first, ask them. Uh, First question I ask folks if they're thinking about running for office is, where do you live? Where exactly is your address? And what does that mean you can run for? It is a question that people do not think about far enough in advance. They wake up one day and say, I wanna run for office. And then they start scouring, trying to think, what can I run for? And they don't realize that maybe they live in a city council district where there's a beloved incumbent that's been there for 20 years and you can't oust that person or the uh, state representative see that they want to run for doesn't align with their party. I mean, th there's a lot of work that needs to go into thinking about being a public servant and, and people uh, take for granted and, and don't think enough about where they want to plant their roots. And then the second thing I would, uh, I would, add, I would try to do is to be sure that they really wanted to run uh, because serving is hard, running is very hard. And um, I do my best to talk people out of running. Um, and if by the time we're done with that conversation, you're still in, then uh, we're hundred percent behind you. But I, I think it's something you uh, certainly do not want to go into half-hearted. Yeah, um, oh, sorry. go ahead and oh, sorry, go, go ahead. I'll, I'll let no, you. No, I want to hear your comments. I, I was just going to say, I feel like that is a very intentional choice that you have to make. And, and um, I like how you approach it, um, going in there, trying to talk them out of it, because it just kind of helps determine their grit, not only you as speaking to them, but, you know, within themselves, uh, what, what they could face. Because, yes, it is a very daunting and difficult task. Go ahead, Nada. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say that the first thing I ask them is, why do you want to run? Um, for office, I ran for office 2017, actually, right after, after the old, everything with Trump and for Dearborn City Council, I lost miserably. And um, I, uh, 
thought I live in Dearborn, you know, um, I have my boats, you know, I have my Dearborn, my Arab American Muslim community. And so people, you know, especially here, we have so many incredible candidates uh, running every year in Dearborn, but I don't think they understand the demographic of, uh, and the voting demographic of our city. So just a fun fact, Dearborn, about 30% on a good year are um, uh, boats from the east and west end, which are predominantly Arab American, go out to vote, and 70% is from the west side, which is predominantly Caucasian. So it's actually very difficult to get an Arab American Muslim or someone with a name like Nadat Hanouti um, to get it up, to get elected. So for me, I want to, I, I really show them what it needs, what they need to do to get elected. I don't think it's, there's nothing glamorous about running for office. Um, uh, uh, Farah and Sam can tell you that it takes a lot of work. First of all, you got to fundraise your community and let's be real, our community are the harshest. My Palestinian community, we were the harshest on me. They asked me the most difficult questions. And second of all, you have to be on the doors nonstop because for us specifically in MGAGE, through our path process, if you are not on the doors or, you, or if you do not intend to be on the doors, then we will not endorse you no matter how much you reflect our values. Because for us, you have to learn the pain of your community and you only do that with face-to-face -face interactions. So there's absolutely no, nothing glamorous about that work. Are you willing to fundraise and ask people for money? Are you willing to be on the ground nonstop? And if the answer is yes, then let's keep talking. I agree with both uh, of my colleagues here and, and have to add, also, do you know your community? Because a lot of times people will run for the title and that's wrong. Uh, you really have to understand why you're running for the position that you're running for. And when you're running for that position, do you know the community that you're hoping to serve? And do they know you? Um, for me, when I first ran, and I didn't win my first campaign either, um, I won in my second campaign, but it's really about building those networks because in Irvine, uh, we don't have a large Muslim population. We are mainly about 41% Caucasian, 40% uh, API, um, most of those Chinese and Korean. And then we have a mixture of Latino, Black, and, and, and everyone else. But it, do you know the community that you're hoping to uh, you know, serve? And do they know you? Because if they don't know you, they're not going to trust you. They're not going to vote for you. And if you don't know them, then whatever you're saying isn't even going to reflect the values that they're seeking in their leadership. So that's going to be very important. Right. Yeah, that's that's very important. Uh, you know, allyship is very important when it comes to representation. Um, Muslims in local, state, and federal government are all fighting for uh, our Muslims, uh, American Muslim seats at the table. Uh, in predominantly non-Muslim spaces. Uh, so what what are the role, what's the role of allies in this conversation and actions to increase Muslim community civic engagement? What would the role of allies be in this conversation so that we can get more representation? Like allied for allies regarding candidates? Like is, is that right, like allies in in the space as far as like uh, non-Muslims working to support the uh, the Muslim candidates. I mean, I, I will say that, um, so I'm the country Muslim. I'm, I'm here in the Western part of Virginia and uh, I'm this the only Democrat in the Western half of the state that's elected in the state house. And then of course, um, this is not as diverse of a region. Um, this is kind of, for Michiganders, this is like the Upper Peninsula um, of, of all places. But I grew up here and was able to, to connect with some folks. And we were able to build enough allies and build the coalitions necessary to, to certainly win an election. But I will tell you this, you know, focusing on similar values as opposed to uh, identities is a critically important piece. In um, the beginning of 2017, the first ban, travel ban, Muslim ban that happened, uh, my caucus was like, oh, who's going to respond to this? You know, maybe the Muslim guy will do it. So I, I gave it a lot of thought and then gave a, a speech on the House floor um, uh, pushing back against the, the travel ban. But the, the speech, and I'm sorry to put it in this context, but, you know, it got a standing ovation from the Republicans uh, in, in our legislature. Here I was arguing against their the president and the, the travel ban. The difference was that 
the birthplace of American religious freedom is the House of Delegates in Virginia. The only document on the wall is the statute for religious freedom. And that specifically was crafted at, to, to push back against any religious test that it is associated with anything that comes out in our, in our country. And we were uniquely positioned to defend uh, religious freedom in, in Virginia. Uh, being Virginians, we were uniquely positioned to do that. And, and so at that moment, we were Virginians. And in particular, we were delegates in this uh, distinct chamber sharing those common values. Um, a few days later, though, is where the real meat of the story um, comes. A, a, a Republican came up to me and he was like, you know, I really appreciated what you said the other day. You really spoke for me uh, and especially for me and my wife, because see, a lot of people in this chamber don't believe that my wife and I are Christians because we are Mormons. And um, all I needed to do was say one or two different words in my speech, and he would have been on the opposite side of, of what he took from it. Uh, but because we were able to relate to those common values, we were able to build those allies, because as a Mormon, he certainly has felt uh, alienated before as well. That is a, a, a really a great example of exactly um, what we're talking about here, um, the importance of of uh, finding the, the common thread that unites us, you know. I know that um, MPAC throughout the past year, um, we've been working to, you know, uh, we've been exploring that conversation with as well with our democracy forums and, and we're, we're working to unite, you know, us with our common values through that, through that initiative. Um, Netta Farah, do you have anything to add in regards to, to that question? I think the only thing I'll add is um, the importance of allyship also goes in building those networks that you need when you're planning on running, right? Um, are you there when labor needs your help? Um, when they're picketing, are you there standing with them? Um, you know, when they're going through hardship, are you speaking out on their issues? Uh, same thing with your environmental groups, your women groups. So there's so many different, whether it's ethnic, race, or religion, um, are you there for them in their time of need? Because that's how you build your allyship. Because when you need something for yourself, those are the folks that are going to step up and come support you. So you got to build those early on. And if you haven't done that job yet, and you're thinking about running, um, I would say take a few years and, and build that relationship up first. No, absolutely. And just picking back off of both of them, you know, we're not free till, till we're all free, till all of our marginalized sisters and brothers are free. So, um, you know, the, I'm Palestinian, a lot of my Palestinian community are, you know, very passionate about um, uh, in Palestinian human rights, but also, you know, we have uh, Black Lives Matter, which is parallel what's happening to Palestine. So just really know that your pain is also shared by your just mom, uh, BIPOC sisters and brothers here. Right, that, that, that's, that's great. All right, I'm going to um, move over to um, questions directly for each, each one of you. Um, uh, Mayor Khan, I'll start with you. Um, we were speaking, or I was speaking earlier of the importance of both the inputs and outputs of the political governing process. Um, innovation and introducing new ideas is really core to both to that, the inputs and the outputs of the political governing, governing process. Um, with your background as an innovative leader in the Southern California area, um, as you utilize new ideas in your campaign and in your, in your administration, what advice do you have for the many Muslims who have um, new ideas and want to turn them into action by running for office? Again, I'll, I'll just emphasize the importance of building those networks uh, of, of people that you know are going to understand who you are. Um, I see so much, especially here in California, uh, people just want to drop their names on ballots, like you know three, four months before election time, and then they're rallying up people to support them. But if you have innovative ideas that you want to share, you've got to share them well before election time. You know, you've got to let the community know if, if uh, you're in the business community or a tech community, let them know what you stand for or what are the ideas that you're bringing forward so that when you openly express them in campaign mode, you're not doing it as a, a hey, look at me, I'm so special you're doing it from an experience point of view. So you're saying, I'm bringing this experience, this expertise to the table that is not there right now. Um, in our case, uh, in our city council, 
you know, we didn't have anyone that came with a tech background. And so when I was running, I was sharing all the things that I wanted to do. And in my administration, starting the Innovation Council, the Innovation Center, and bringing those communities together, but not only doing that, but telling them that we've got disadvantaged folks that we could be helping. So now we're connecting the tech, um, the VCs, and, and all those folks with a pipeline program that actually helps our diverse and, and um, you know, low-income folks get the same opportunities of sharing ideas or sharing their um, creative um, projects and making sure that they get that level playing field to move on up as well. And so as you're working along, you have to remember who your community is and how you can take your innovative ideas and help everyone. Yeah, and that also um, speaks to you being uh, authentic as a candidate and also as an elected official as well. You know, being true to what your what your um, what your interests are, what your passions are, what your expertise is, and bringing that to your communities so that you can help help the community. All right, um, I'll move over to um, Yuna. Um, you've been essential to MGAGE's Million Muslim Votes campaign as executive director for the Michigan chapter. And as a product of the community of De Dearborn, can you talk about the monumental role of community organizing, not only in elections, uh, but in the social change that's possible because of it? No, absolutely. Um, so I'm gonna give this very local example of the work we, we've done uh, for Abdullah Hamoud uh, last year. So in 2021 in Dearborn, um, we were first time we had the opportunity to elect an Arab American Muslim mayor. And it's, I wanna discuss like representation beyond looking and praying like this, but we really need to think about values. Do they have the same values as us? And Abdullah was someone who grew up in the East side, grew up not very wealthy. Um, you know, shared the same pain as us um, um, and knew our issues. So we were very excited first time, oh my God, we can elect someone who completely understands our community. So in 2021, unfortunately also, um, we had uh, a major flood happening in Dearborn. And um, that's when actually I learned that infrastructure is actually a Muslim issue. Um, it actually flooded the east and south end of Dearborn, which is predominantly Arab American, Muslim, brown. Um, and then of course the west side was dry. So we learned how much the, um, the, the, the city is actually um, investing in um, our infrastructure. A lot of our, our community members we're living in their mold and in the south end of Dearborn has um, a, a large population of Yemeni immigrants, a lot of them whom are undocumented. And when we canvass those doors after the flood, we saw a lot of them actually living in basement apartments in mold, unable to advocate themselves because they are undocumented. Um, and then also in the south end of Dearborn, um, we have one of the highest levels of air pollution. Um, uh, uh, the environment is a Muslim issue, ladies and gentlemen. We have to, we have to, we have to um, start being really tough on companies like a AK Steel in um, um, in the south end of Dearborn, who is the reason why our residents are developing cancer and asthma. And Abdullah is well aware of it. And he's been holding them accountable since his times in the Michigan legislature. And then we also, when we canvassed, we canvassed 24,000 doors with my organizers, we learned that a lot of our community members don't even know what time the polls are open. They didn't even know anything about absentee voting. And a lot of them are actually turned away at the polls when they have a translator. And a fun fact with um, uh, Dearborn, about 52% of the census speak in um, language other than English at home. So we did all that we could. We, with our doors, with Abdullah, we knocked 90,000 doors. Um, uh, and then Abdullah raised five million dollars, um, half a million dollars, and then his opponent Gary Warnchak um, did nothing. Essentially, raised maybe one tenth uh, of the f money that Abdullah has raised, and Abdullah won by two thousand votes. But um, and that's how much work, by the way, BIPOC candidates in Dearborn, the largest population of Muslim and Arab in the country, have to do to get elected. And then what we also did, we, um, we also endorsed city council members that we know share our values. So this past, um, before we, we did this work, we were having conversations with our city clerk to um, introduce translated ballots in Dearborn. He said, you know, there's no need for them. We don't need these translated ballots, which is, you know, pretty baffling, especially for our community, you know. Um, so we kept fighting it. We realized it was an ideology issue. So when we got um, Abdullah elected, when we got these city council uh, members elected, we actually wrote over it, read the city clerk and finally got translated ballots. And last August, um, people who look like my grandmother, who do not speak English, naturalized citizens, 
voted in dignity, voted in dignity by themselves using a um, translated to be ballot. And that is so, so powerful. Local organizing, not only like you elect people that look like you, but also you pass policy that people need. And right now, Abdullah is completely doing a huge, um, a huge uh, um, uh, assessment on the infrastructure. He also passed little things like having um, free swimming pools for children 13 and younger because when he grew up, he could not afford to do that. And we have, and Dearborn's working class community or having fences now that you can be six feet tall because so our veil um, sisters can go out without hijab. So that's just a prime example of how community organizing matters, how representation matters and how it directly affects policy and how that policy directly affects your lives. That's great. Uh, that's a great example. Um, we, we had Amir Abdullah on uh, one of our calls recently and and what you what you're outlining is basically speaks to the the passion for taking care of his community that that I witnessed when I was on that call and I'm sure many others did as well and I also wanted to um, say that um, uh, what educating citizens on on these issues and how they're speaking up and raising their voice um, educating them on under, on understanding why it's so important to raise their voice um, really um, goes a long way. Uh, as, as you can see, this hard work is, is done because of people uh, such as yourself, Meta, that are going out there and, and, and raising awareness and, and bringing education to the community. So thank you for your work. Thank you so much. All right, I'll move over to Delegate Rasul. You are one of the two Muslim delegates in the Virginia State House. How do you approach the process of building political power for Muslims statewide? Oh, I think you're on mute. I want to say that it is very hard to serve at the local level. And I'm at the state level. So if you're a mayor, or as Neda was talking about uh, in, in Michigan as well, and in, in Irvine and, and in Michigan and Dearborn, it is it is tough because they're they're much uh, the, the issues are are not as partisan. It's just there are a lot of issues to take care of, and people demand answers at the state legislative level and especially at the federal. You just kind of get to um, you know uh, think of things more in a in a in a, in a partisan camp, um, and and uh, so if if um, you ever see one of these local electeds, make sure you thank them for all of their wonderful work. It's a reminder. Um, you know, as we're thinking about power building and in the community we mentioned earlier about building it through allyship, uh, that is uh, pretty important. And, uh, you know, I was elected in 2014. I was the first Muslim ever elected in Virginia to anything, to, to anything. and and, you know, I remember going around, there was a lot of excitement and I went to this one big event for me they had in, a, in another city uh, and, and they came together and it was a nice celebration, you know, we, we made history. And, and at the tail end of the event, I remember uh, a, uh, an uncle, hopefully everybody knows what an uncle is. An uncle came up to me from the community and he said, Sam, we're very happy for you, very good. But excited, but I have a question. Um, then he leaned in. He said, "What about the gays?" And 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 I, you know, th these are Im important topics that the community needs to be able to have constructive conversations around, uh, especially portions of the community being, uh, you know, socially conservative. I I said, Uncle, look, let me let me tell you how I think about it. When I uh, made uh, my pledge, it was on the Virginia and United States Constitution. And my obligation, just like in any other, uh, many other professions, is to protect the rights of all Virginians based on those documents. Whether or not, you know, someone agrees or disagrees with someone on an issue is irrelevant. Uh, my obligation is to protect and enhance those rights and it, is, and it says something about me and about us as a community, even when we may not see uh, things eye to eye sometimes with, with individuals. However, this uh, is how we should be marching. And, and it is not incongruent, uh, even though I'm, I'm pretty liberal on the issue, it's not incongruent for you, Uncle, to stand up and say, I'm for equal rights for these individuals, uh, even though I might have a personal uh, difference of opinion. 
uh, meaning he might have a difference of, of opinion. And it kind of clicked at that point. There can be this, this dichotomy of what we, what we believe because we want people who may, may not see eye to eye with us all the time to say they have the right to believe that way, even if we disagree. Uh, and that is the beauty of trying to build power and build allyship. Uh, and that's the right way to do it long-term. That's beautiful. That's, that's, a, that's really great. All right, um, I'll head back over to you, uh, Mayor Khan. Um, what do you hope for the long-term community impact of being the first Muslim woman to lead a large city in the US? I think for me, it's always been about building that pipeline, right? So um, after me, who's coming up next? Um, who are we helping um, gear? Right now, I'm working with two other women that I hope will run in 2024 and um, for different offices. But it, it's, it's so important to be that mentor, that person that can kind of find those gems in the community that are interested and that um, really have their heart in the right place to be able to go out to them and say, hey, are you getting trained? Like, let's put you in the eMERGE program. Let's put you um, in front of some folks that you should be talking to. Let's get, take you to labor events. Let me take you to uh, environmental events. Let me get you connected to people so they know who you are. And I think that's something that's very important for us to do is we get to a, a place where, where you know, you have to fight hard to get to where I am, but are we making it a little bit easier for the person coming up next? And that's really important. Um, you know, they shouldn't have to go through the same struggles that I did. If I can get those connections made for them or if I can help them figure out which area is best for them to run from or who to reach out to, then, then I feel like I'm doing my job in making sure that there is a pipeline of people coming up after us because, uh, you know, I always hear it's great to be that first, but you don't want to be that last. And, um, and you don't want there to be gaps in between either. Um, all the work and progress that we're making now, we want to continue that and build upon that. And the only way to do that is to make sure that there are people coming up behind us. Yeah, uh, riding that momentum and um, continuing, like paving the path for the next generation. And thank you for inspiring others uh, to, to run for office and to follow in your footsteps as well for being the first uh, American, uh, American Muslim to be elected to office in a large city. Um, Nada, uh, can you share insights into what organizes and mobilizes the voting eligible population of American Muslims to become activated Muslim voters that turn out every election cycle? How do we how do we activate our communities? Yeah, I think for us, um, it's it's the people when people look like us, that's when we get most excited. I actually started to engage in 2018, the summer of 2018, which was the largest election year for Michigan Muslims, and probably honestly throughout the country because everyone was so excited over Michigan. We had Abdurrahman Sayed, we had Rashida, um, you know, we had Ibrahim Ayash, we had Fayrouz. So they got, you know, our community got so excited that finally people look like us, believe like us, and shared our values that know our struggle are running for office. And that's what motivated them. And I would even argue that, you know, because I think um, Abdurrahman was the, one of the top largest Muslim vote getter. He got 350,000 votes. However, I think that was a record for Muslim for a Muslim candidate. And that's actually helped um, Rashida and other Muslim candidates down the ballot. Um, but what is, to be frank, what's really difficult is when you get to the general election, when our BIPOC candidates are weeded out. And how do you right now, we have the issue um, in, the, in the generals in Michigan. In the primaries, it was really exciting. We did work for Rashida, she won. We did work for Andy, you know, he didn't make it and people were very disenchanted by that. So now we have a lot of incredible races. We have to protect the governor's race. We have um, we have um, the um, Supreme Court justice and we have uh, the Promote the Vote, which is a ballot initiative to protect our voting rights. But how do you get our community excited about that? And the, re the way we do that is through the doors and through face-to-face -face engagement. So to be frank, the representation gets our community out there. But when we have this time, like we do in the general election after you know our, our exciting candidates got weeded out, this is when we have to do the face-to-face -face and educate them what's at stake. Um, this is what happens when you don't vote. If we lose the government, this is what's gonna happen. Um, if we didn't have a proper Supreme Court or promote the vote um, uh, ballot initiative actually would have not gotten clear, um, uh, certified because when what was used to be um, a formal uh, uh, 
what used to be a formal, um, uh, just a, um, a ceremonial process with the Board of Canvases is now politicized and always taken the Supreme Court. So now we're just kind of um, educating folks the gravity of what it means for you to vote in the general election, but it is a lot harder when you don't have exciting candidates. Yeah, I th again, thank you for that hard work and, and leading the efforts in Michigan and in regards to that. You know, that's work that each and every one of us can also take part of if we feel passionate about uh, about a position, you know, um, speaking on our shared values, as we mentioned earlier, um, that we can all, you know, work together to to activate our community to to participate in the, in the elections. Um, all right, Delegate Razul, um, on your campaign website, you have a section titled Virginia Grit, where Virginians can fill out their contact information and invite you to speak to their neighborhood group. Can you talk about the importance of meeting constituents where they are to discuss these policy issues and how you've approached these conversations given the polarized nature of national politics? Mm. Yeah, when, uh, when I first ran um, for office, I knocked on this young man's door. He came out, he may be in mid-20s, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm running for US House. There's another guy, Senator Obama. He's running for president. Uh, we, we would certainly appreciate you know, your vote in the upcoming 2008 general election. And he leaned over and he said, well, I'll vote for you, but I ain't voting for Obama. And I said, why? He said, well, you know he's a Muslim. And I said, well, you know, he's a good Christian man. Um, but I'm a Muslim, and uh, you know he was taken aback because it's probably the first Muslim he's ever talked to, uh, and and got to got to know. And of course, we were similar in at an age, and turns out we had a lot in common. You know, of course, growing up here in the foothills of of Appalachia, uh, the reality is is that um, you know the way we were, the way I eventually was elected was by just knocking on thousands and tens of thousands of doors. Uh, because, you know, people, when, when the day before my election, when I eventually was elected, the day before they sent out mail pieces and it said, guess who's funding Sam's campaign? Al-Qaeda sympathizers are funding Sam's campaign. Um, our heart dropped because we didn't really have the time to, to react to that. And alhamdulillah, we won in a 40-point landslide when everyone, including us, thought it was going to be a toss-up uh, election. And it was a testament to these beautiful people out here who were like, you know what, you can say a lot of things about candidates, but this is a guy that knocked on our door. He grew up in our neighborhood. Uh, we've seen him for years. He's been active. Uh, we're not buying that nonsense. And alhamdulillah, they gave us an opportunity uh, to, to uh, serve and then, of course, be reelected multiple times uh, after that. And so nothing replaces meeting people where they're at and empowering them. For example, two programs that we use for that. We have a You Write the Bill program, which I designed, which is constituent uh, and uh, based uh, bill writing. So uh, for example, next week, we'll have our first session for this fall. People will come out, get in various groups um, based on issues, and they'll actually write bills. We'll have attorneys that will write bills. And then some of those bills will be introduced into the legislature. We actually had one uh, pass here recently that was written by this group. Imagine that, uh, this participatory uh, uh, legislative uh, making is, is something that uh, you know, opens people's eyes uh, about how things work. So that and a couple of other programs uh, that we've employed to try to do everything that we can to make sure that people are, are feeling empowered. Yeah, that's wonderful. It, it speaks a lot to, um, um the face-to-face -face conversations you can have connecting one-to-one uh, -one, uh, and, and that's why going door to door is so important. You can uh, impact perceptions that way, you know, and, and combat some of the, the, the misinformation that may be out there and the disinformation by having those one-on-one -on -one conversations and finding those shared values. That's, that's wonderful. I'm going to open the floor to any questions for our speakers. If anyone has any questions, uh, please go ahead and um, raise your hand and I will have our, uh, I'll go ahead and give you the floor to speak. Or if you prefer, you can put it in the chat as well. All right. Don't think we have any questions. Um, 
I'll just go ahead and um, leave all right. you all with We have a question, question from Cheryl. Oh, okay, great. Go ahead. Good morning. Awesome. Like them. Like them. Um, I, I think it's it's a it's a common and a question because I, I'm listening and uh, we have a a couple of clubs here in Northern California. One of them is a a Muslim dims and frames club. So we 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 talk, we meet, and we try and uh, come together as is Muslims. Is is uh, one of them is is a democratic club. Another one is a little more nonpartisan. And recently we had a gathering and we were talking and they, they got us together as, as elected officials, very similar to what we're doing today. And one of the questions came up and someone asked us about how you got involved and how do you stay authentic to yourself? And I want to, to say to, to this group, because I'm, I'm hearing you, but I'm also uh, I think it's important that when you get elected, that you don't forget the, the thing, especially that's in the title. We're American Muslim elected and appointed officials. And a lot of times what happens is there seems to be an urge to assimilate into this culture. And there tends to be an urge to forget the fact that we are Muslim. That doesn't mean that you have to forget that you're serving non-Muslims. I never forget that. I don't forget that we're serving the entire populace, the whole community and the constituents, but that doesn't mean that we, we are examples for the people, for the young people who are looking up to us. When those young people saw me on a billboard, I thought that the best thing that I did was when, young, when I went into a classroom and someone said, I can be a scientist because I see this lady who looks like me as a scientist. But when they see a hijabi in a position of position of, of influence, but who doesn't compromise their values, I think that's most important. So what we when we walk our walk and we walk our talk, I think that's most important. So yes. It is important to say to other people, but it is just as important for non-Muslims to see us, just as it is important for Muslim children to see us because as you said, sir, uh, Rasul, they don't see us very often. So we say the example for them. So being authentic is very, very important. And a lot of times we don't see that in Muslims. We see uh, a willingness to compromise just so we can get elected. Emerge is a wonderful program, don't get me wrong, but it is very whitewashed and it whitewashes our candidates. So I would like to see us come together and have our own program on Muslims running for office. Impact can do that, Engage can do that and what that needs to stay authentically a Muslim candidate. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, uh, Cheryl. Um, though that is, it is very important to stay authentic to yourself as you, as you move into um, elected and appointed office and um, truly representing your community. Do, do, do any of our speakers have any thoughts um, in response to, to uh, Cheryl's remarks? I would just agree with her myself. I'll just say the only way I explain it to people how I got elected, where I was elected is the concept of Niya and your intention and people can feel your intention and that authenticity you know, shines through uh, whether or not you're being authentic uh, always quickly shines through. It's a strong human uh, trait for sure. So I appreciate those comments. All right. Um, I'm going to move on to our next question. Mohammed. I, I believe Mohammed has his hand raised. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. And thank you to all of our uh, panelists. 
Um, I've heard that it's said that a uh, that elected official is only as good as their staff. And as a former staffer, I may be biased, but there is some merit and there's some truth to that. Um, and I know that um, at MPAC, we do have a program through CLDP where we place interns on Capitol Hill. We pay for their housing, we pay for their room and board and provide them with access to speakers like yourself. Is there a similar program that identifies talent in the American Muslim community so that we can get our own onto campaigns? Um, if you look at Obama's 2008 run, a lot of his senior staff, he, they went to the White House. So if there's a way to get our people on, on the campaign trail, whether it's helping an elected official from a Muslim background or, or even a non-Muslim background, but getting them in the room to get these candidates elected and then you know go for the ride along with them. Um, I just and, wanna... And, 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 and maybe that could address the question posed earlier, where that perhaps could prevent a whitewashing from a policy perspective, because then they are able to bring the experiences of the American Muslim community to a non-Muslim uh, elected official. Um, I just want to um, give a shout out to New American Leaders. New American Leaders is an amazing program um, that helps uh, first generation immigrants um, run for local office. And subhanAllah, majority of the attendees are actually Muslim Americans. And I went through it, I went through the fellowship and they really show you not only how to run for office, how to ask for funding, but really to try, stay true to your values. And at MGH here, we actually did a collaborative um, emerging leaders training with New American Leaders this year, because what happened in 2021 is that we saw all these incredible candidates that did not have the resources, not have the funding, and did not have the knowledge to run for office. They did not know what it actually meant to run for office. So we actually went down to the nitty gritty things of how to use van, how to recruit, um, um, how to recruit your, um, uh, your field, um, your team, and then also how to prioritize your work and your spending in um, in campaigns because that's always an issue too. Um, and we, well, it wasn't only for candidates; it was also for um, people who want to work in campaigns because we want to empower our community members to be involved, to have that skill, and like you said, to be able to work with these candidates so they can have a position when they are elected. So again, um, New American Leaders, I can put their website here. They're actually um, accepting recruitments right now for the new cohort, and I can leave the link right here. Um, and also, if you want more information, I can leave Amina Ahmed's email. I'm sure she would not mind. Um, who works on recruitment. They're a wonderful organization. And of course, when we do have our emerging leaders training, again, if you're from Michigan, please um, join us next year because we really do get in the mechanics of how you, how you what you need to do to win a campaign or to um, be effective as someone who works in a campaign. Great. Thank you, Nada. Thank you for your question, Mohammed. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So we are getting close to the end of the hour. Um, and so I would like to offer our speakers, um, thank you so much for, for joining um, us today and, and sharing with us your experiences. Um, but I would like you to, if you have any closing thoughts as to what you would like to leave our audience with, um, as we head into the midterms, what is the most important thing that each one of us can do today? Um, and go ahead and uh, share your thoughts and want to be respectful of your time. So brief thoughts would be great. I'll start with you, Mayor Khan. Great, thank you. Um, just that, you know, um, a lot of people don't get excited for midterm elections. Um, the presidential elections seem to get more people excited and, and out. But remember, there's a lot of important um, propositions and um, especially when you look down ballot, there's some important races that you need to understand and be educated on so that you're making that uh, educated vote and not guessing or leaving things blank. Um, what we wanna make sure is folks are engaged not only um, on candidates, but also on issues that um, are coming into law. So please make sure that you reach out to um, friends and your networks to understand what's on the ballot and, and what's beneficial for you. Wait, I'll go ahead and head it over to um, Delegate Rasul. Final closing thoughts. Yeah, I um, think that, uh, you know, it's great to have, first of all, thank you to um, Soul Group and, and Delara and, and many others who helped to organize us. It's great to have a network of appointed and elected officials um, to uh, be able to bounce ideas off of and, and, and to be able to lean on nationally uh, for sure. Uh, my, my one thought that I would leave folks with is voting shouldn't be the focus of your message and shouldn't be 
the end in and of itself. Um, you know, it's kind of like I have three children and I try not to just tell them they need to eat right. I like to first talk about what the nutrition does to their body and then say, here's what we can do about it, eat right. And so if we just go to our community and say, it's your obligation to vote, you gotta vote, uh, we expect you to vote, they don't know what that means and, and exactly what, how that impacts their life. And so I, I would encourage all of us at, uh, to keep that in mind and, and try to meet people where they're at. Uh, and hopefully we'll, over time, uh, people will be able to see that, the, the, uh, that this is just a, a step along the way. I want to echo um, what the, my fellow panelists said. I think it's really important to know the issues of your community and to discuss uh, with your community members how these certain candidates can actually um, be the part of the solution to these issues. Like Rashida ran in Dearborn for the first time because um, we three districting. She now rep, um, she now will represent Dearborn, and um, a lot of people didn't know. Again, there was elections, and you know, with Rashida, one of the huge many things in her resume is that she is she's um, helped so many of her community members from not getting deported. We have so many undocumented community members. So um, immigration is a huge issue um, here in, Mich um, in Dearborn again, um, uh, you know, um, water infrastructure. And then um, so uh, and when you educate them on that and that's how you build up, this is why your vote matters. Um, specifically here in 2020, it's um, in, uh, uh, in 2022, it's so important for us to elect our sec Secretary of State, our Governor, our Attorney General again. Our Secretary of State is a reason why we're able to have absentee ballots in Michigan. And honestly, you can credit her for um, why Biden won. We had a lot of our vulnerable citizens that cannot vote due to COVID. So if you want to preserve our voting rights um, and make, make sure that we elect people and people do actually go vote and elect people who represent our issues, you know, you need you need to do um, your your part in getting out the vote, and then um, and, and educating people why they need to do this for the long term. Yes, that is that is very important. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for joining us today um, for this important conversation and sharing your experiences and thoughts um, as we you know head into the. Uh, elections. I hope we can all keep this in mind, and you know, share with our our families, our friends, so that we can, you know, make sure that we see that representation when it comes to the uh, the elections. Um, Delara, I'll go ahead and pass it back over to you to go ahead and close out the the webinar. And again, thank, thank you. you, thank you, Mayor Farah Khan. Thank you, Nada, our great colleague from Engage Michigan. Um, we know the Muslim Civic Coalition and Nada have connected several times. Uh, thank you to our dear, dear friend, Delegate Sam Rasool, and thank you, Rebecca Husseini of MPAC for um, moderating this great panel. Um, again, wanted to share that American uh, Muslim elected and appointed officials, really it's about like, okay, once you're elected, once you're appointed, you know, we still need that network. We need, still need that support. We still need to talk about the issues that we're, we're working on across the nation. And this is what AMIAN is. It is facilitated by the Muslim Public Affairs Council, America Indivisible, and the Muslim Civic Coalition. And please go ahead and take a look at any of these um, organizations and go on amian.org. Again, as we started, there are over 500,000 elected officials in the US. How do we ensure that they understand us, that they know us, that they see us? But how do we also ensure that some of them look at like us? And some of them are us so that our own values, core uh, issues, et cetera, are part of the greater American community. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to our next quarterly meeting in the, in the winter, and we will talk to you then. And please make sure if you want to sign up at Amion, we will then send you more information on things that we're doing. Take care and good luck. And please vote November 8th and get everyone else to vote that you possibly can on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.